I am Dr. Madhulika Sinha, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Government Bilasa Girls, PG College, Bilaspur, Chhattisgarh. This video is for the students of literature studying in BA Part 3. This is Paper 2, American Literature, Unit 5. William Cuthbert Faulkner, The Sound and the Fury. William Faulkner was born on September 25, 1897 and died on July 6, 1962. He was an American writer and Nobel laureate from Oxford, Mississippi. He wrote novels, short stories, screenplays, poetry, essays, and a play. Primarily, he was known for his novels and short stories set in the fictional Yuknapathwa County based on Lafayette County, Mississippi. His work was published as early as 1919 and largely during the 1920s and 1930s. He became the only Mississippi-born Nobel winner when he received Nobel Prize in Literature in 1949. His two works, A Fable and his last novel, The Rewers, each won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. In 1998, the Modern Library ranked his 1929 novel, The Sound and the Fury, sixth on list of the 100 best English language novels of the 20th century. On the similar list were As I Lay Dying, Light in August, and Absalom and Absalom. The Sound and the Fury. It was Faulkner's fourth novel, published in 1929, and was not immediately successful. However, in 1931, Faulkner's sixth novel, Sanctuary, a sensationalist story was published, which Faulkner himself later claimed that it was written only for money. Then The Sound and the Fury also became commercially successful and Faulkner received a critical attention. When Faulkner was writing the story, it was tentatively titled Twilight, narrated by the fourth Thompson Child. But as the story progressed into a larger work, he renamed it The Sound and the Fury. The title of the novel was taken from Macbeth's famous soliloquy from William Shakespeare's Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5. Quote, Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools, the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing." Unquote. The novel recounts the way to dusty death of a traditional upper-class southern family. The last line is perhaps the most meaningful, Faulkner said in his speech upon being awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, that people must write about things that come from the heart, universal truth, otherwise they signify nothing. It employs several narrative styles including stream of consciousness. The novel's unconventional narrative style frequently alienates new readers. Although the vocabulary is generally basic, the stream of consciousness technique which attempts to directly transcribe the thoughts of the narrators. Faulkner has been praised for his ability to recreate the thought process of the human mind. Characters in the novel, Comsons, Jason Comson III, father of the children, a lawyer who attended the University of South, a nihilistic thinker and alcoholic with cynical opinion. Carolyn Bascom Compson, wife of Jason III, a self-absorbed neurotic and an abusive hypochondriac. Quentin Compson III, the oldest child, passionate and neurotic. Candace Caddy Compson, the second willed and caring, the true hero of the novel, according to Faulkner. Jason Compson, bitter, 
रेसिस्ट थर्ड चाइल्ड बेंजामिन और बेंजी कॉम्सन मेंटली डिसेबल्ड फोर्थ चाइल्ड मिस क्वेंटिन कॉम्सन डॉटर ऑफ कैडी कॉम्सन वाइल्ड एंड प्रोमिस्कुअस अनदर कैरेक्टर्स डिल्से जिप्सन द मेट्रियाक ऑफ द सर्वेंट फैमिली हर थ्री चिल्ड्रेन वर्श फ्रोनी एंड टीपी दे सर्व एज बेंजीज केयर टेकर्स थ्रू आउट हिज लाइफ लस्टर इज द सन ऑफ फ्रोनी द स्टोरी इज टोल्ड इन फोर चैप्टर्स बाय फोर डिफरेंट नरेटर्स बेंजी द यंगेस्ट कॉम्सन सन क्वेंटिन द ओल्डेस्ट कॉम्सन जेसन द मिडल and Faulkner himself acting as an omniscient third person narrator who focuses on Dilsey the Compson's servant Benji Quentin and Jason narrate in the first person as participants they narrate in a stream of consciousness style attentive to events going on around them in the present but frequently returning to the memories from the past The final section is narrated in third person omniscient by Faulkner himself. The world outside the minds of the narrators slowly unravels through personal thoughts, memories and observations. The two tone differs in each chapter depending on the narrator. Three of the chapters are set during Easter weekend 1928. while quentin's section is set in june 1910 the memories the narrators recall within these sections cover the period from 1898 to 1928 the four parts of the novel relate many of the same episodes each from a different point of view and therefore with emphasis on different themes and events faulkner uses italics to indicate points in each section where the narrative is moving into a significant moment in the past part 1 narrated by benji a source of shame to the family due to his diminished mental capacity his narrative voice is characterized by its non-linearity spanning the period from 1898 to 1928 His narrative is a series series of non chronological events presented in a stream of consciousness. In this section we see Benji's three passions: fire, the golf course on land, and his sister Caddy. By 1928, Caddy has been diminished from Compson's home after her husband divorced her because her child was not his. In the opening scene Benji was accompanied by Luster a servant boy watches golfers on the nearby golf course as he waits to hear them call Caddy the name of his favorite sibling when one of them calls for his golf caddy Benji's mind embarks on a whirlwind course of memories of his sister Caddy in 1898 when their grandmother died The four children were forced to play outside during the funeral. In order to see what was going on inside, Caddy climbed a tree in the yard. This is Benji's first memory and he associates Caddy with trees, often saying that she smells like trees. Other crucial memories in this section are Benji's change of name from Mori after his uncle in 1900 when his disability was discovered the marriage and divorce of caddy in 1910 and benji's castration resulting from an attack on a girl when a gate is left unlatched and benji is out unsupervised the greatest barrier to benji's ability to narrate is the fact that he has no concept of time He lives in an endless present time. He interprets all events and memories as taking place in the present regardless of when they actually occur in his life. Faulkner uses Benji's limitations to introduce one of the novel's motifs, the human experience of time. Part 2 
Quenty, the most intelligent of the Compson children, gives the novel's best example of Faulkner's narrative technique. We see Quentin as a freshman at Harvard, wandering the streets of Cambridge, contemplating death and remembering his family's estrangement from his sister, Caddy. Like the first section, its narration is not strictly linear, though the two interviewing threads of Quentin at Harvard in one hand and of his memories on the other. His main obsession is Caddy's virginity and purity. He is obsessed with southern ideals of chivalry and is strongly protective of women, especially his sister. He was horrified when he sees when Caddy engages in sexual promiscuity. He turns to his father for help. But the pragmatic father tells him that virginity is invented by men and it should not be taken seriously and time will heal all. He tells his father that they have committed incest. His idea of incest is shaped by the idea that if they could just have done something so dreadful that they would have fled hell except us. He could protect her sister by joining her in whatever punishment she might have to endure. In his mind, he feels to take responsibility for Caddy's sin. Quentin, wandering through Howard, followed the pattern of his heartbreak over losing Caddy. He thinks sadly of the downfall and squalor of the South after the American Civil War. Tormented by his conflicting thoughts, and emotions, Quentin committed suicide by droning. Faulkner completely disregards any semblance of grammar, spelling, or punctuation, instead writing in a rambling series of words, phrases, and sentences that have no separation to indicate where one thought ends and another begins. This confusion is due to Quentin's severe depression and deteriorating state of mind. Therefore, Quentin arguably an even more unreliable narrator than his brother Benji. Part 3. The third section is narrated by Jason, the third child and his mother Caroline's favorite. It takes place on Good Friday. Of the three brothers, Jason's narration is the most straightforward, reflecting the single-minded desire for material wealth. This desire is made evident by his bad investments in cotton, which become symbolic of the financial decline of the South. By 1928, Jason is the economic foundation of the family after his father's death. He supports his mother, Benji, and Miss Quenty, Caddy's daughter, as well as family's servants. His role makes him bitter and cynical, with little of the passionate sensitivity. This is the first section that is narrated in a linear fashion. It follows the course of Good Friday, a day in which Jason decides to leave work to search for Miss Quentin, who has run away seemingly in pursuit of mischief. Here we notice it, the conflict between the two predominant traits of the Compson family, which Carolyn attributes to the difference between her blood and her husband's. On the one hand, Miss Quentin, recklessness and passion inherited from her grandfather and ultimately the Compson side, and on the other, Jason's ruthless cynicism drawn from his mother's side. This section gives us the clearest image of domestic life in the Compson household, which Jason and the servants means the care of the hypochondriac Caroline and of Benji. Part 4. This last chapter takes place on Easter Sunday, the day of Christ's resurrection 
and thus a powerful symbol of redemption and hope this is the only section without a single first person narrator focuses on dilsey the powerful matriarch of the black family on easter sunday she takes her family and benji to the colored church through her we sense the consequences of the decadence and depravity in which the compson have lived for decades dilsey is mistreated and abused but she remains loyal she with the help of her grandson luster cares for benji she takes him to church and tries to bring him to salvation she loves benji and believes that god loves benji regardless of his lack of intelligence she looks on the compson's tragedy with sadness but does not let it contaminate her own spirit the preacher's sermon inspires her to weep for the compson's family reminding her that she has seen the family through its destruction which she is witnessing meanwhile the tension between jason and miss quentin reaches its inevitable conclusion miss quentin has run away in the middle of the night with carnival worker having found the hidden collection of cash in jason's closet and taken both her money and her money obsessed uncle's savings jason sets off once again to find her on his own but loses her trail in nearby motson and gives her up as gone for good after church dilsey allows her grandson luster to drive benji in the family carriage to the graveyard luster disregarding benji's set routine set routine drives the wrong way around a monument benji's became hysterical and his hysterical sobbing and violent outburst can only be quieted by jason jason slaps luster and in attempt to quiet benji hits benji breaking his flower stalk while screaming shut up after jason gets off the carriage and luster heads home benji suddenly becomes silent luster turns around to look at benji and sees benji holding his drooping flower benji's eyes are empty and blue and serene again faulkner narrates this section himself and takes us a step back from the compson's inner world and provides a more panoramic view of the tragedy that has unfolded the compson become carried away with the greatness of their own name neglecting the strength of family in favor of self absorption dilsey on the other hand is the antithesis of self absorption she is the redeemer of the compson legacy her new role represents a reversal of the traditional southern order a black servant once considered the lowest position in southern society is the only torch bearer for the name of a prestigious white family the novel closes where it started with benji for a moment we return to the world of order and chaos that exists in benji's mind benji becomes peaceful order prevails and the elements of benji's experience return to the places where he expects to find them after the novel faulkner wrote appendix in 1945 to the novel to be published in the then forthcoming anthology the potable faulkner the appendix is presented as a complete history of the compson family lineage the appendix is presented and beginning with the arrival of their ancestor quentin maclachan in america in 1779 it also reveals that carolyn compson died in 1933 jason declared himself benji's legal guardian 
It also presents some textual differences from the novel but serves to clarify the novel's opaque story. The appendix concludes with an accounting for the black family who worked as servants to the Compsons. Unlike the entries for the Compsons themselves which are lengthy, detailed and told with an omniscient narrative perspective, the servants' entries are simple. Dilsey's entry, the final in the appendix, consists of two words, quote, they endured. If we see the themes, motives and symbols, themes are the fundamental and often universal ideas explored in a literary work. The corruption of the southern aristocratic value is the theme of the novel. Resurrection and renewal is again the theme in the novel the failure of language and narrator. Then motives. Motives are recurring structures, contrast or literary device that can help to develop and inform the text major themes. Time, order and chaos, shadows are the motives. And symbols. Symbols are objects, characters, figures or colors used to represent abstract ideas or concepts. Water and Quentin's watch are the symbols used in the novel. I am sure this video will help you to understand the novel The Sound and the Fury. Thank you.